Hello, I am the Rhythmic Biker and this is my 2007 Triumph Sprint ST1050, a bike that was recently reviewed in April 2022 by MCN who gave it a whopping 5 out of 5 overall score. In my opinion, it is the best sports tourer of its day, beating the likes of the Honda VFR 800 with its weird awkward VTEC system. Lockwood, I promise I like your bike. Why don't you and me delve a bit deeper into the Triumph Sprint? Right, well, hello everybody. I hope you're all safe. I hope you are all well. And before I crack on with today's video, let's start off with some good news. Sprinty here has just passed her MOT with a clean bill of health, no advisories. Big shout out to Holland Engineering Services. Services, cannot talk. Well done. Well done, Sprinty. Right, so before you do any bike review, you should always go fully fuel up. That way there won't be any hiccups. So, whilst I'm at a fuel station, Uncle Red in front of me, whilst I am here and the bike is now fully fueled up and all that good jazz, you might, have, uh, you might remember, literally seconds ago, that I mentioned at the start that MCN recently gave this bike five out of five for its overall rating yeah. very well thank you yeah. cool <laughs> god damn it so what i'm going to do first is just get you through all the boring little statistics stuff that you would expect to find on the mcn website so we have a three cylinder 1050 cc fuel injection engine here producing 123 brake horsepower and 106 newton meters of torque it has a top speed of 160 yes 160 wowza miles per hour it has a massive 21 liter uh, fuel tank so that's capable of uh, doing well i've actually had over 200 miles from a tank so but to be honest you're guaranteed over 150 but i've had over 200 so it all depends on how you ride uh on average these are probably looking at 45 miles per the gallon so not too bad not too bad still affordable to uh to justify owning one i suppose dry weight dry weight is 210 kilograms and the wet weight fully loaded is 241 kilograms so that's probably what we're pushing now with a full tank of petrol and the seat height is 805 millimeters high so i actually don't think that's too bad for the uh for the shorter rider i i do think this bike is quite low to the ground so you should have no problem moving it about except for the weight if you struggle with that <laughs> But that's the boring stuff out of the way. So let's quickly turn our attention to what we see here in front of us, the dash display. So on your left down here, you have your speedometer in uh, miles per hour and obviously kilometers per hour for whatever reason, in case you're riding in Europe or something. Uh, in the middle there, very nice and big and bold, you have your, your RPM counter. This bike red lines at 10,000 to 12,000 RPM and uh, on your right you then get this uh, this digital sort of display and uh, that's got various options clock uh, miles that you've traveled your trip obviously um, it's got your miles to the fuel station it's got a uh, average miles per gallon counter it's got a live miles per gallon counter it's also got a top speed um, <laughs> it's also got a top speed screen so it records the the fastest the bike has ever gone unfortunately or actually maybe not maybe fortunately that resets every time you take the battery off 
of course so you get to i don't know maybe try and beat your high score i don't know really why that was put in there but it was um it's also of course got a fuel gauge it's got a temperature gauge um here really basic sort of technology you've obviously got a uh, push start you've got a kill switch you've got high beam low beam a pass button there your indicators and your horn other than that that is it it's a uh, very basic when it comes to uh comes to the display up here things that i've added to the bike to be fair not much uh the bike came already with uh, some quite handy features it came with a uh, double-sided crash bungs that i'll probably put a photo up because uh me riding the bike and showing you just yeah that ain't gonna do anything it's uh i put this phone holder on I, I i tend to do this on just about every bike i own simply because i'm awful with directions and i can't i can't do directions with just the sound so i always need it here just to occasionally look down on uh it has also got new tank protectors so all these gel overlays which i really like really trying to stick with the british theme but we'll see we'll see how long that goes on for um i also put the exhaust on the delkovic exhaust system which sounds incredible yes it does pop it does crackle it does crack it does everything The bike also came with uh, this already much higher screen, um, which is perfect because I probably would have done that anyway. Again, it's another mod I tend to do on most bikes I own. And it also came with heated grips that I've never ever used in two years of owning it. So I'm actually um, starting to flirt with the idea of buying a new panel down here because the previous owner decided to put the box there and cut it out it's a fairly clean cut from what i can see so i'm not mad but if i wanted to put it back to um non-heated grip uh, non-heated grips i would have to i'd have to get rid of that because it, it just it would look messy and uh i like a bit of tidiness despite how dirty the bike is at the moment ignore that i've also remapped the bike um it's always advisable to do that when you change the exhaust system go see a specialist obviously i haven't got the skills nor equipment to do that stuff myself um, although it's actually doable from home on these bikes with a program called tune ecu the fella who i uh, took it to great chap he actually does it all from home but uh yeah thankfully over the years of this bike being out people have developed maps for it for different exhaust systems or different riding styles different weathers in, in fact so uh, fair play to all those all those nerds out there who uh, know what they're doing messing about with the engine etc and the ecu so let's move on to the good the bad and uh, the damn right ugly uh, let's start off with the good good things about the bike well obviously i'm gonna let the mcn review speak for itself really here um i quite tr I, like, I quite trust i trust the mcn reviews quite a lot they're normally quite in depth so um i'll leave links of course to that review and you can have a read of it but uh for me having owned the bike for two years number one would have to be the bike is very comfortable uh, i can ride this for absolutely hours on end with uh, with no problem it's obviously a sports tourer so you'd hope that it has that it has that comfort but it, it is quite a rich sports tour and what i mean by that is you you get the smiles that a sports bike would give you but you get it without it destroying your back or your wrists i'm much more comfortable on this than i ever was on my fzs 600 phaser so um yeah comfort is just absolutely incredible it's so comfortable hours on end riding number two would be that it's very practical very practical indeed uh my one came with the pannier boxes which of course have come in handy whenever trying to shift a lot of stuff on a motorcycle or for touring um for example me and red go into the peak district i used those panniers to no end every single day most secondhand ones that i see on the market most of them come with panniers i think they all came with panniers after like 2007 or 2007 onwards but it might have been 2008 so don't quote me um, if the owner who you're buying it from doesn't have the panniers definitely question it question whether they ever had it and if not why not <laughs> 
but even just without it it's got a little glove box compartment uh, down by the throttle uh, so that comes in handy it pretty much only fits a tool kit in there but I suppose you could get your mobile phone in there if you wanted uh, there is a charging connector uh, thing <laughs> behind this fairing that's to plug in uh, your optimizer for the winter if you're going to put the bike up because it connects straight to the battery I have a feeling that was aftermarket I didn't put it on but someone's definitely put it on um, but yeah it's just a practical bike you know you still get those uh, you still get the performance from a sport bike like I say 160 mile an hour top speed 123 brake horsepower it's no slouch by all by any means but uh but it is built for uh, for practicality on the motorway put this in sixth gear 70 miles an hour you're at 4,000 rpms the engine is hardly working and speaking of the engine that's another good point it's that famous uh three cylinder 1050 cc engine that and i do think it's famous try and use it obviously in the speed triple in the tiger and um for me those bikes have always been landmark landmark bikes something that this bike should have been it should have been a landmark bike in my opinion obviously with that three cylinder 1050 engine you get superb mechanical reliability i don't care what simon gtr or rev bomb will joke about with this leaking oil some triumphs might leak oil but uh but not this one this one has not put in two years it has not mechanically put a foot wrong I know, I know a few other, I know a few other people with Triumph Sprint ST 1050s, and uh, they have all said mechanically, there's a solid. I think they have come a long way, or I think they did come a long way from the 955i. I do think that, I think that had some mechanical hiccups here and there, but not these ones. They are mechanically sound, very reliable, very reliable machines and uh without going into too much and saying how much i love the bike i'd probably say one of its biggest strengths is its value for money i paid uh, i paid just over sort of four grand maybe i think for something when i bought this two years ago with the panniers low mileage etc and uh, it's been worth every penny i think right now you can pick you can pick a battered one <laughs> if you want a battered one you can pick one up for under three thousand pounds but if you want a decent one, be prepared to pay sort of three five, yeah, three thousand five hundred, four grand still. Um, but for me, for the amount of bike that you get, that is that's just value for money. And there's not a lot, in my opinion, in the modern sports tourer market, considering that it mainly went to adventure bikes, that would beat this bike. Just ask MCN. <laughs> please forgive me that the darkness has now arrived i've been at a bike meet all night and it's been it's been wonderful absolutely wonderful but picking up where we left off so we've done the good let's now cover the bad and the ugly so first thing i don't like in the night are the headlights they are shocking they're like candles a lot of owners will put the night eyes leds um headlights on them and uh, it's a pretty straightforward swap but uh yeah not one that i've actually done i've just never got around to doing it i don't really ride at night much so unless that changed i probably won't do it but definitely a recommendation uh, i absolutely hate these mirrors these mirrors are awful they're a weird shape i don't quite like them they're not adjustable back or front they're only sort of twist up to fold them in and they're just very cheap very flimsy they vibrate they um they're very plasticky and it's yeah it's not it's not nice of course when the bike came out it wasn't the most expensive bike in the world so you get what you pay for but yeah i'm uh, really not a fan of them um onto the dash as you could probably see if i hold it there there's no gear indicator which i really don't understand on a bike that is made around touring or sports touring because you'd still want like surely if you're on a long tour well, i know me anyway i i'd like to know what gear i'm in but uh, there's no gear indicator you can install obviously aftermarket gear indicators but with it being a triumph aftermarket electrical gizmos aren't recommended the triumph does not like them the other thing sticking with up here is there's no hazard light and uh, i'm i'm a big fan for people who have watched the channel 
watched other videos, you guys would know that I'm a big fan of hazard lights. Because you never know when you'll need them. It's always nice to have when filtering. But sadly, this bike does not come with hazard lights. The gearbox on the Triumph Sprint ST1050 is also not very forgiving. It will punish you if not used correctly. It's very stiff, it's very clunky. So uh, beware of that. The bike is prone to overheating. Um, nothing drastic like it cutting out, but especially on like a summer's day, it's so common to see that your temp gauge will be very close to the maximum. It just, yeah, sitting in traffic like this, it absolutely hates that. It, it does overheat. But in the manual, it's, uh, it actually says that it does, its idle temperature is actually warmer than the 90 degrees of, uh, say, any other bike. <laughs> any other bike that I've rode anyway. So yeah, temperature. Because of where the exhaust is, it sits right underneath the seat. Um, yeah, when I had the stock system on with the back box, my goodness, would your, would your tushy get, get a bit warm. Very warm, in fact. However, replace it with an aftermarket and um, yeah, I don't seem to have many issues since. The uh, heat shields that are underneath the seat are just, they're, they're not thick enough um, and it is just a sheet of metal. So um, yeah, they should have done a bit more when it comes to stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> ignore Red, ignore him. What else on these? Suspension's not great either. I've rode bikes similar to this. Uh, sports tourers, adventures, super sport, and um, yeah, they didn't get the suspension on this right. If you really wanted to feel what this bike is capable of or transform this bike, you'd probably be looking to spend six, seven hundred quid sorting out the suspension. Don't know. Wow, <laughs> don't know what's going on here. Yeah, so you know, get the suspension professionally set up again. It's not something I've done as I don't seem to notice it too much, but if you're tracking it or something like that, you definitely want to go get that professionally done. Uh, suspension linkages as well. Also, they need to be serviced, taken apart, stripped, re-greased every sort of two to four years. It's the same with the uh, rear adjuster, the rear hub. It's a, That's quite big servicing work, but it is needed every two to four years. It's a single-sided swing arm, so it's it's fairly easy to reach and everything like that but it must be done it absolutely must be done otherwise especially with the the rear hub because if that locks up and seizes it's going to cost you well normally normally it's a new a new swing arm so don't mess around with it now earlier i spoke about this bike's mechanical reliability and i stand by that mechanically it's solid However, electrically, these are known to have some problems. So, when I bought the bike, the first two things people told me to do were to what they call puddingize the bike. And that is basically to buy some pudding cables, which are effectively heavy duty starter cables for the Sprint, because without it, eventually the stock ones will fail. And to buy a MOSFET um, regulator, rectifier, because uh, without that as well, the stock one will give up and you'll be left with no power. So that's annoying, but they were, those were two things that I did very quickly. However, since then, I've had fuel sensor go on me. I've had the temp sensor go on me. All of these, by the way, do stop the bike from running. The ECU is, uh, the ECU is triggered to just cut the bike completely, cut power. So you can't ride it and damage it. Basically puts itself in like dead mode. And the TPS throttle position sensor went this year, um, and that was not that was not a cheap job. And also, it seemed to mess up the map that had been put on my bike with the exhaust. So, yes, when that was fixed, I had to get it re remapped again. Frustrating. And all of this can be a bit of a hiccup. It can be annoying. It can cost a bit of money. I hate electrics. I really do hate electrics. So those are the bad points. It doesn't leak oil. <laughs> it doesn't leak oil, despite what some of the other motor vloggers might joke about. So to summarize, the story of the Triumph Sprint ST1050 is a bit of a sad one for me. 
Not because it's not a fantastic bike, but mainly because it gets overlooked by so many bikers so often. And I think, in all honesty, if Triumph look back on this bike, they probably have a lot of regret. If only they could have seen how successful the Kawasaki Z1000SX would go on to be, then I'm pretty sure they would have stuck with this a little longer. However, I've enjoyed owning it for two years, and I really would recommend this bike to anybody who's on the market for a sports tourer on a bit of a budget. With all of that said and done, is it a bike that I'm likely to keep forever? Probably not. And that's not because I don't enjoy riding it, I really do. And it's not because I don't get the same buzz that I got when I first bought the bike. It's mainly because I don't think these will go on to become a classic. And I think as they get older, the wear and tear might start to show a lot more. However, I'm still the proud owner of this Triumph Sprint ST1050, and I will continue to do so for however long. If you have enjoyed this video, why not give it a thumbs up? If you've owned a Triumph Sprint ST1050, or you're on the market for a Triumph Sprint ST1050, or you just like watching bike reviews, why not leave a comment down below? I would love to hear from you. If you're new to the channel, why not consider subscribing? It really does help me out. Why not also head over to Instagram and drop me a follow, at The Rhythmic Biker. Thank you guys so much for watching, and until the next time, cheers.